Thank you to both uh, Paul and Jeff. Um, we have some time for questions, so please do come up to the microphones um, and introduce yourselves and ask the question. Um, I just have to say thank you again to your wonderful presentations. Um, something that I heard that ha that you, both of you talked about was partnerships, and I appreciate that. You know, understanding climate change is such a big feat that we can't do it on our own. We do need the partners, partnerships. And what I did hear from Paul was that. Um, Local public health is on the front lines, and somebody that I admire is constantly saying environmental health is profoundly local. And uh, it was fascinating that you said less than 5% of local health departments have the capacity to respond to climate change, and so that's where the partnerships um, are most important. And I also appreciate, um, based on who your audience is, uh, you call it climate change or not, it doesn't matter. The solutions are where we are, you know, going to benefit the, the most. So I appreciate both of your comments. Linda? Off with the Center for Climate Change and Health. Um, both Jonathan Patz and Georges Benjamin talked about the importance of framing climate change as a health issue and having people in health and healthcare talk about climate change as a health issue. Um, but Jeff, you sort of talked about not leading with climate change. Um, and I know from having perused many, many, many local health department websites, including Milwaukee's, that climate change is not prominent in the communications of almost of any but a, a, a tiny, tiny number of local health departments. So I'm wondering how you reconcile those two things and how you see the responsibility of health leaders in actually raising the level of awareness amongst the public and policymakers that climate change is one of our greatest health challenges. I can, I can go first. Um, I, think, I think that's a very good point, Linda. Um, I, I have um, to start out in 2007 and 8 to start working on this. I looked at my board and said, um, if we're going to really get to where we need to go, it's going to be millions of dollars in investment. And if I said to the board, I need millions of dollars to mitigate climate change, um, it would have been a non starter. I, 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 wouldn't even, I wouldn't have had a venue, they would have just shut me down. What I, what I had to do is say, what do they value that overlaps what I value? What is the overlapping circles? Now, if they ask me, Jeff, do you believe in climate change? I was very clear about that, and I've spoken out about it in a number of places in our community, in our region, and around the country. Um, but to practically get it done within an organization and to get a community heading forward, um, I had to say, what were their values that overlapped with our values and and you know with with the nuns it was easier than with some of the business people um, but but once I showed them that you could do both which conventional wisdom and you know still a lot of people that just keep going through this mantra about you you can't do uh, both um, we, we had I had got my teeth cut on this a little earlier we had advanced care planning was a thing that Gunderson had done very well and and had been pushing um, other and teaching other people around the country to work on advanced care planning. And during the ACA development, the, it, that blew up into the death panel piece. Um, and so we had a lot of national baits and a lot of news and things like that related to that. And it was, you had to bring it back to what was really most important. The inflammatory edge can always take something and run with it. So um, I am happy and take every opportunity I can to speak in public, both locally and regionally or nationally, and be really clear that the health effects of climate change are devastating and that there is better evidence for climate change caused by people than there are most of the medical treatments in this country. Um, however, that was not what it was going to take to get the job done, and so that's why I framed it the way I did. 
And so I mentioned that public health is on the front lines, but really, I mean, private health care is a public health partner that's truly on the front lines and I think has an incredibly critical, essential role in broaching the climate conversation within the community. Um, the reason you're not seeing it on Wisconsin or, or any of the municipal websites in Wisconsin, it's not politically popular at this time, given our current our current governor, as well as some of our municipal leaders, to really even put uh, the, you know, the phrase climate change um, and make that public. It's not clearly a priority. It's not tied to an economic agenda, as I mentioned earlier, around workforce development, job creation, um, education, or even public safety. So I think there, there needs to be a way to navigate um, the conversations with um, policymakers and other key um, community leadership and champions um, to begin to um, really address um, the impacts of climate change in a manner that creates a win-win. In other words, cost-effective economic solutions uh, that um, are good for community health but good for business as well. And that has yet to be done in Wisconsin. Um, certainly we recognize the challenge. We have yet to come up with an easy solution. Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Patz, University of Wisconsin. I can't help myself with two other Wisconsinites up on the panel there to, to say something. Um, a question at the national and international level. Uh, Paul, this is for you. For you know, nationally, aside from the CDC BRACE grants on climate change adaptation, um, you know, where, you know, how pervasive do you think climate change awareness is uh, across NACHO, NACHO, um, and um, you know, so organically coming up and really being on the table nationally. And um, for Jeff, you know, you, you've just been in China and Finland, and in the audience, uh, Pan American Health Organization is here. Um, Daniel Buss is here, to, you know, saying how there's still um, a problem with the health ministries showing up at climate change discussions. And it's, you know, it's either environment ministry and, and health is even in the national adaptation plans um, and in the uh, mitigation plans, the, the nationally intended, uh, and the nationally determined mitigation plans um, for Paris Agreement. Health is not in the national plans, uh, Daniel was just telling me. So in your own experience uh, from the healthcare sector and traveling around internationally, is this getting any traction uh, internationally. So. so I can tell Jonathan's getting hungry when he mentioned Nacho or Nacho instead of Nacho, John. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Food's coming. Um, so it's an emerging issue that's gaining traction at Nacho, particularly, particularly around the emerging younger workforce. So now we have a climate health work group and Nacho Love, and I'm not sure if ASTO has a similar um, uh, kind of work group in action. And most of the discussions have centered around um, what locals are doing, um, but not very strategically. So there isn't a cohesive, comprehensive strategic plan that links, I think, federal, state, and local public health agencies on this issue. I think it's slowly emerging fits and starts. Um, right now, again, focusing on most case studies that are kind of all over the board. Not that I find that unattractive, because I think that can be very stimulating from an innovation, innovation standpoint. It really demonstrates unique partnerships, collaborations among non-traditional stakeholders, especially, as well as ways to shift the conversation and dialogue outside um, kind of the group think that tends to uh, keep many of us in the trenches around climate, climate health issues. So I find that attractive, but it, we are missing a more comprehensive strategic plan. And I have a feeling we don't have strong leadership. And, and I don't, don't mean to be overly critical of the CDC. I don't see a strong voice or leader at the f national level on this. I mean, APHA is very good, a very strong promoter and advocate, but absence of a strong leader or champion, I think we're gonna struggle uh, with developing this comprehensive strategic plan that interlinks us horizontally and vertically across our communities nationwide on this issue. 
I think uh, the, the opportunity um, is not dissimilar than other times in history when uh, governments may have dragged their feet for one reason, uh, political, financial, or other reasons. Um, we, we have the wherewithal to move forward on this. We have many examples of uh, medium-sized organizations like ours, very large ones like Kaiser that you're going to hear from Kathy coming up that have said, well, we're going to make a change and do this for There's a international uh, group of mayors that work on these issues. There's states that have just said, we don't care what the federal government thinks. Here's where we're going to go with this and, and just take it on. I, I think the, the movement forward is uh, to say um, the cause is so important that we will build coalitions of people with similar values, maybe not exactly the same cultures, but similar values and a similar goal. Um, if you have similar values and similar goals, you can, you can, you can get something done. Uh, if you don't have those, then it'll just be a mess. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there's a medical society group that's uh, being formed uh, to focus on things. Uh, the AMA seems to be interested. It's very interesting. It's been a very an old, staid, organization for generations um, that now seems to be interested, I think, unusual partners. Um, in Beijing, the, this director general of health, cabinet level person of health, came out and said, we're killing a million Chinese a year because of our pollution. They never admit things like that. Um, he said, we're a third world country. They hate saying that. A third world country when it comes to energy and pollution and health. By 2030, we're going to be the middle of the European Union. By 2050, we're going to be a world leader, and we will spend the money needed. Last year, they built two wind turbines and a football field of solar every hour. Um, so at, uh, in Paris, it was pretty clear. Th the rest of the world knows Jonathan's chart. Th they know who caused the problem, us, Western Europe, and who's going to get hurt? Central and South America, Africa, parts of Asia. I mean, that, the only people really debating that were the people in the United States and Australia. Everybody else yeah, pretty much understands that is the way it is. Um, so I think we don't wait for the government. We just build coalitions and crash ahead. <clears throat> yeah, Dave Kindig, University of Wisconsin. Maybe building on that, I mean, I'm just so impressed with the business case that you present, and I guess my question is, A, I mean, I know there's sustainability about in healthcare organizations and businesses, but to, at least what I know, not to that degree. So maybe tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, to what degree is that model just being understood, snapped up, and put into place? Or if not, I mean, are there, what's unique about Gunderson, where they seem to push the envelope like this, as with the advanced directives and, and all that. So, but maybe first, what is the state of acceptance given a business case like you just presented? Um, the state of acceptance is on a, a steady upward curve. Kathy, you can correct me later. Um, um, Kathy and I have done this together a lot, and she actually gives my talk better than I do. Um, so the, the state of acceptance is on an uphill curve. There's steadily more and more people. Um, a, f a couple years ago, we developed an organization um, uh, called the Healthy Hospital Initiative. And in the in, uh, course of three years, it went from a dozen organizations saying, let's report how we're doing on some major factors, to 1,400 hospitals or health systems in the country reporting on how they're doing on uh, energy or conservation or waste management or water. Um, so there is an escalating interest in both the effects on health and the fact that this can be um, an economically viable alternative. It isn't the same, so everybody, nobody's going to adapt the Gunderson model exactly because there's different environments in different uh, places. Um, places that have more sun and with the lower uh, costs of PV, uh, they, they, they should not be messing around with dairy digesters. They should go to PV, for Pete's sake. It's so much less complicated. Um, so there'll be different solutions in different places. But I think it is, uh, I, I think it's improving as fast as we'd like. It's, it's not as fast as we'd like, of course. But, but I think we're heading in that direction. And I think as 
the generation kind of changes over in leadership, it becomes a more natural act than an unnatural act to, to go down this road. I was just going to make one comment, and I think what's missing in the current narrative is what does success look like from a climate-healthy business economy, and how does that intersect with national security and global economic goals and interests of this country? And so until we begin to define, again, the intersection of national security, economic security, and that narrative of what success looks like given the current goals and interests of this country, typically defined by its citizenry, but I'm not sure that's as healthy as it should be. I think it'll be difficult to establish, you know, what a good strategic plan and that trajectory looks like. So. I have a question for Paul. Um, you talked a little bit about trust building with communities, and I was wondering if you can give us an example of what that would look like. Yeah, so, so trust building, really, this idea of relationship building, authentic and genuine relationship building, is kind of a core of a lot of public health programs. Easy to talk about, difficult to achieve, right? It takes time. It takes, you know, face-to-face -face encounters. It takes uh, developing win-win um, situations that, again, are mutually consensual and agreeable. Um, so I can't give you, I mean, I can... For example, the rainfall harvesting piece was really, in my um, estimation, really a win-win uh, in many different fronts. It was a win for public health in engaging that particular community. It was a win for the community on establishing food security, especially for a very vulnerable population. As I mentioned, we, we located um, the project within a, um, the large male homeless shelter smack dab in the mi middle of the city, which I think was very profound. Um, it was a win-win in terms of public-private partnership, which we talk a lot about but seldom achieve um, successfully with Reflow Sustainable Waters, uh, the City Health Department, and also our, our sustainability program. It supported our Homegrown Milwaukee Initiative, which really um, w w won a finalist award. Um, uh, and dealt with repurposing vacant properties into community gardens over the last five years in the city of Milwaukee. So it strengthened and established that. Um, to do all that, it, it, it meant, you know, coming together, developing that strategic document that did create a true and consensual win-win for the partners involved. And it really takes that conversation. It takes um, the right message and format to make that happen. Um, not all of us are good messengers or able to broker those, um, that dialogue or those uh, deals, so to speak. I hate to use that word deal, but <laughs> you need, it's all about the deal, right? Um, and then really to agree on what constitutes successful outcomes um, for each partner. So, but trust is incredibly important. It just takes time to build and it's not, you know, prescribed, it's developed, right? Penny Magnin from the Population Health Roundtable. So, Paul, I just want to follow up on that, uh, what you were talking about, building trust. And you had mentioned in your talk about uh, community social capital. And so it sounds like in that particular case, say the rainfall piece, you were building social capital, but you also talked about the challenges of decreased community cohesion and increased social instability. I, I, are you seeing those things affecting the ability to work on the changing climate, or are you saying that actually working on it, we might be able to impact those things? Well, I, think, I think both. Again, I mentioned in my opening remarks, Milwaukee is a high, highly segregated city, unfortunately, with great racial divides that have, like in many urban environments, created tension between government in this case, the police department, public safety, and its citizenry. So I think that can work against building trust. On the other hand, when you develop these types of really what I think meaningful, seminal, productive um, partnerships as we did, I think you can lessen or assuage uh, those tensions and concerns in the community through, you know, really walking the talk, quite frankly. So building trust is doing what you say you're going to do in an honest, transparent way, which is difficult for bureaucrats to do. To, walk, to be transparent, you know, 24 seven and do what they said they were gonna do in the time frame, time frame allocated. So I think it works both ways, right? I think, again, it can deter that relationship 
or it can you know, strengthen. And by social cohesion, I think that's incredibly important to understand in your community, again, the tensions that exist, the trust that, or distrust that exists, and what you can do to be a broker of, uh, you know, a change agent in that regard. Thank you. Do we have a question from a remote audience? So it's actually a comment, and it's a comment that relates to the Kentucky panel. Um, somebody had a, sure, it's, this is from Patricia Martz, who's um, with the health department in Edmonton, Alberta. And she was commenting about the just transition um, a remark that Lisa Abbott made. Um, she said an analogy, look at tobacco farmers in southern US. They no longer grow tobacco, they grow chickpeas. As a bonus, they don't chew tobacco, they chew chickpeas. Um, and then she pointed out that in um, Leavenworth, Washington, when they closed the logging um, timber industry there, they diverted into tourism. And that in 1962, the Project Life Leavenworth Improvement for Everyone Committee was formed in partnership with the University of Washington to investigate strategies to revitalize the struggling logging town. Hi, I'm Pamela Russo from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, great presentations. Um, and Jeffrey, we're always looking for those examples of where there's a business case for a healthcare system to invest in its community and to figure out what the mutual win-win is. And so you really demonstrated that mutual win-win situation. Um, and I so have two questions for you, sort of in the lessons learned. Would you ever have counted any of that work that you did at, in your community benefit reporting? Um, and secondly, were there issues about different states, different localities that, that hindered or advanced your ability to do those things? Um, I should probably know more of the details about whether we actually did, we, we had, we did a lot of things in the community and I'm, I'm not sure which portions of our environmental piece went in. Many of these things were done with people in the community, uh, for profits, uh, construction company in Organic Valley, we did wind turbines with them, the county, I mentioned the city, we have a joint investment to improve our regional neighborhoods, a blighted neighborhood that we're working on, and uh, so we have so many of those partnerships um, that we've worked on, I'm not sure which, which got reported. I, I certainly would tell you by state by state, since we have Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin, it is a morass of, of rules and regulations, and it's different in every state, and we, tr we, we of course, are, we have a responsibility to follow the law, but that is, that is, big, that is a big challenge uh, to get to do that. I can tell you, though, that um, despite its complexity, um, we have had good luck working with those governments and people in the federal government. I, I mentioned John uh, before, but, but um, we're, we're almost always able to find people who are inspired enough to roll up their sleeves and say, let's find a way, mm -hmm. um, rather than just say, no, you can't do that. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, kind of in relation to, to that and, and David's question, which I avoided, why, why did we get this done at Gunderson? One of the things they appreciate is long-term thinking. There's a lot of political things that aren't such long-term thinking. I didn't have an election cycle. I didn't worry about I didn't have a cycle. We, we don't have cycles at Gunderson. We don't have yearly bonuses for the executives. We don't do that. And so, so there wasn't a, there wasn't a long-term cycle. We, we had um, a little better tolerance for risk. I'm an ICU pediatrician, so risking a few thousand dollars one way or another. I, I spent my whole life taking care of very sick babies and children. That's risky, making those decisions. A few thousand dollars, yeah, the, not so risky. Um, so that, that was uh, pretty easy. The asset use piece, we would say this is, this is a good use of your assets to for-profits or for not-for-profits and say this is a good use. You don't have to just sit them in savings all the time. And I think the most important piece was that it was consistent with a values-based approach. So, so whether it was part of the faith community or the business community or the government, the education, higher education, they, they saw that it was a values-based approach that wasn't changing, 
It wasn't shifting in every time we had a quarterly report. It wasn't shifting. So, so treating finances as a tool, not as a goal. Go, the, it, now, did we have to, sorry, did we have to hit financial targets? Sure, but, but it was a tool to accomplish the mission, not, not a goal for individuals or the organization. People knew that, and then it was easier to get government, NGOs, business partners to throw in with us and work hard on, on, on uh, difficult things, but get pretty good results. And then once you start getting results, people like to work with somebody that gets results. Thanks. Well, I think that's the end of our time. Can you all help me in thanking the two presenters one more time?